What is going on, everybody? Welcome into another edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up here on this gorgeous Tuesday, November 7th, 2023. As always, I'm your humble correspondent, Michael Tanner, coming to you from an undisclosed location here in Dallas, Texas, joined by the executive producer of the show, the purveyor of the show, and the director and publisher of the world's greatest website, energynewsbeat.com. Stuart Turley, my man, how are we doing today? It's a beautiful in the neighborhood, and the news desk was crazy today. Absolutely. We have an absolutely stacked menu lined up for you guys. First up on the show, China, Russia intensify efforts to expedite new gas route in new supply agreement. Next up, Southeast Asia's LNG investments predicted to hit peak by 2040. That's according um, to a new study um, out of the Asia Research and Engagement Institute there in um, Singapore. So Stu will cover what all they're saying. Next up, Mid uh, Mideast War turns spotlight on Arab gas pipeline um that's big for all you know speaking of lng development um that's huge and finally following bp's exit operatorship of giant gas discovery changes hands as u.s player takes the rings dun 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 um so we will uh Stu will dive into exactly who's taking over that big bp gas position over there he'll toss it over to me i'll quickly cover what happened in the oil and gas markets today um and then touch slightly on a deal that happened in canada um interesting i was familiar with the canadian m&a market as as uh, I am the U.S., but this is an interesting deal, and and, and we'll, uh, we'll 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 cover it from from a few different angles, and then we will uh, let you guys get out of here and start your gorgeous Tuesday. Before we do all that, guys, remember everything you are about to hear. The stories and analysis are brought to you by the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all of your energy news. Um, I highly recommend checking it out. Stu and the team does a great job of curating that website, making sure it stays up to speed to make sure you're at the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy business. Um, appreciate um, the team's hard work for that. You can hit us up, dashboard.energynewsbeat.com. That's our data news combo. Um, leave us some comments, email the show, questions, energy news beat.com you can find us apple podcast spotify um wherever you get your podcast check us out on youtube at energy news beat um and again appreciate everybody who 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 uh, supports the show check out the description below timestamps links everything you'll need um to, to to stay informed with the show i'm gonna breath those two where do you want to begin hey let's start with my buddy um uh if the producer could slide in the picture that we have for us this is actually what i think i look like but I know the dude. That, you think this is what you you think you look like the dude? The dude. This is actually Jeff Bridges, and I mean he looks good. And so now uh, the the it's a little gif, and he goes, <laughs> "It's the best Scooby I've seen in a long time." And Ananias uh, is actually a wonderful resource on Twitter. And so we'll have his uh, contact information. But let me read this one phrase to you because. I really had to go, hmm, but it made sense. If the Biden administration is trying to bring additional oil supplies from Venezuela and Iran to avoid high and gasoline, oil and gasoline prices next summer before the 2024 ele elections, they will not succeed unless we have a recession. End of story. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's I, I I think what we're doing with it with with Venezuela um, and trying to bring the I mean, it's it's pretty backwards considering what we should be doing, exploiting our own energy resource. So pretty crazy. I, I don't get it. And and quite honestly, I think Ananias is dead on right, because if they in order for it to work, they're going to have to have a recession in order to have a recession. They're going to people are tired. All right. Let's run on down the road. I just I love Ananias. China, Russia intensify efforts to expedite new gas route supply agreement. Michael, this is a 30 year agreement that is mm -hmm. just nuts. When you sit back and take a look at the collaboration between China and Russia, it is mm -hmm. going crazy. So right now, the 30 year agreement deliveries commenced in 2019 it will reach full capacity of 38 billion cubic meters in 2025. Michael, that is a lot of gas and a lot of energy for um, uh, through Siberia to China. Isn't that crazy? Yep. 
Well, it what it really does is it is it you know it it it, it shows a few things. I think the first thing it shows that sanctions, as much as we wish they work, don't. And not to pat you on the back again, Stu, but sanctions don't work because if you don't have every single country commit to them, it doesn't mean anything. So you know, we try to cut off oil supply here. We try to cut off gas supply via the Nord Stream. I mean, we didn't bomb it; it was somebody else. So just put that out there. Um, the sarcasm, of course, it was the Ukrainian seals. But we, they're going to find a way to sell their product because it's 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 a valuable commodity in the market. Um, I do find it funny, you know, in my opinion. The real question is they're striving to build a closer energy partnership. I mean, that's a middle finger to the U.S., Stu, a big middle finger to the U.S. and the West. Oh, it is. And uh, that is increasingly uh, something we see in all the articles. In fact, there's a couple of great ones on in Newsbeat today where they're having uh, the whole everybody is flipping their finger off at the U.S. So, all right, let's all right, roll next? to the next one. Southeast Asia. LNG investments predicted to peak by 2040. So we have a peaker here on the show. He just happened to walk in. I think it was Jerry Nadler's. He was walking off stage. More natural gas. That was funny, by the way. Um, more natural gas facilities will be firing in Southeast Asia in more than two decades. That is just nuts. Um, here comes, if allowed to continue, the expanded LNG uh, stands to thwart efforts to keep global warming below 1.5. Growing investment in LNG by the Philippines, Vietnam, and other Southeast Asians will not only help push the world further beyond this critical target. People don't understand that the only successful markets that will be rolling will be the Asian markets because they're going to continue to use low cost uh, energy and they're going to actually have lower uh, input imprint than using renewables. Look at this, Michael. The Philippines mm -hmm. received a shipment in April to fuel a thousand two hundred megawatt um power plant uh even though through its declining uh reserves in the natural gas field the lng is saving asia yep well uh, because it's it's it provides again that baseload energy that people so desperately need specifically where you're in um um, a, a part of the world where access to low cost energy can drastically right. improve your standard of living. You know, I think it's interesting. Kurt Metzger, he's the energy transition director um, for that Asian research um, council. He said Southeast Asia's limited legacy LNG infrastructure makes the pivot to low carbon power sources a viable option compared to investing in new LNG infrastructure so i think what they're attempting to do is say since they don't have any lng we might as well go build some unprofitable wind and solar so we know where that'll end up oh absolutely it'll be back into germany uh shooting themselves in the foot and you know providing some extra shoes for them to eat in the winter all okay. right what's next let's go to let's go to the next one we're gonna go to the mid midwest mid east pipe war turned spotlight on Arab gas pipeline. Boy, I got all choked up on that one. Michael, um, the Israel-Hamas war has not significantly impacted Mideast oil and gas flows, but I'll tell you what, it's shaking everybody up and really bringing energy security mm -hmm. to the forefront. Um, Jordan imports almost all the energy it needs. If it's, uh, it would have serious socioeconomic implications. I mean, that's just amazing. Um, if we take it, uh, the, there's a map on this. If we could have the producer slide it in. Uh, mm -hmm. You take a look at that uh, pipeline. You have the Egypt pep pipeline around Port Said. Uh, you have the Arab pipeline. You have the gas future ex extended, the dotted line there. Um, and then you take a look at that, you eliminate that pipeline and it becomes a horrible problem there. Well, and I, I think I've been covering this for the past week. I think that the, the sentiment on the street has been, wow, this, this Israel Gaza war that's going on right now hasn't really moved prices upward. If anything, we've seen a, a softening of prices and why? Well, on a macro level, it doesn't look like 
it doesn't look like there's going to be a huge effect on the overall supply and demand, considering that Strait of Hormuz will always stay open. I mean, we've deployed a, a nuclear submarine to the Mediterranean, if only because we understand the vital importance of making sure things like these gas flows and oil flows continue. But I think what's interesting is that doesn't mean that countries inside this Arab gas pipeline and who are connected to could uh, experience short bursts of them not having the available um, gas that they need. I mean, specifically along that Egypt-Gaza border right there, as you mentioned, from Port Said mm. um, to Ashlakhan up there, you know, really right there north of the Gaza Strip. So it'll be very interesting. Yes, overall, worldwide gas flows and oil flows may not be affected so much to the point where we've seen a softening of prices, but that doesn't mean something crazy could happen. And I think this article does a really good job of of kind of separating the two and say, sure, Overall, world supply might stay the same, but we may have spurts of zero supply going through this key area, which could lead for massive terminal. They mentioned Lebanon, specifically Syria. Um, you know, there are other things, Jordan, as we mentioned um, right. earlier. So lots going on in this region. Oh, it, it is. And, and so buckle up. We don't know. We hope for the best. But, uh, Michael, yeah. that brings us to the next one coming around the corner. Following BP's exit. Uh, operatorship of giant gas uh, discoveries changes hands as U.S. player takes the reins. Mm -hmm. I really like this one. Um, and, and Cosmos is the, um, I believe, Dallas-based uh, energy firm that's taking over for this. And I was looking around on their website today, and they are uh, a offshore um, firm. Do you know much about them? I mean, I know a little bit about Cosmos. I know the fact that, you know, they're 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 what I would call a cash flow style company, which means they're going to live and die off cash flow. And if they're going in and acquiring this 90 percent working interest, specifically in this gas field, it means right. they plan to produce the heck out of this 25 trillion cubic feet that they've got. So I think it's an interesting move. I, I you know, from BP, it probably is more of a consolidation of their assets to the Gulf of Mexico versus a, you know, a move that maybe makes operational or economic sense. We know they've been pulling off um, wind farm. This is probably a shift away from heavy natural gas wind assets right. specifically to be able to invest more um, in their oil business. Um, but, but, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this goes. You know, yeah. these large projects, you won't know if this is a good deal or not for two, three years. But in two, three years, it'll be obvious whether or not it's a good deal. And we'll be able to look back and see if that that 25 trillion cubic feet is actually a legitimate number. Yeah, that field, the uh, Yakar Tangara uh, gas field, uh, he they got ninety percent working interest in that bad dog. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Um, yeah, it's it's a lot. They can they, they'll be able to crank it up. I'm gonna reach out to uh, Andrew in, uh, English and see if I can get him on the podcast. That would be a really good one to visit with. See what his thoughts are on it. It would. You want to talk about people in the forefront of energy security? Right there, baby. All right. That's all I got, man. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and, and quickly shift over to finance here. Overall markets were fairly um, slim today. S&P only up about eight, uh, about tenth of a percentage point. NASDAQ up three tenths of a percentage point really as, as the market um you know, comes under and really is digesting a lot of the data that happened last week. We obviously saw the Fed come out and keep interest rates the same. We saw a few other um, data points, specifically unemployment, um, come up, you know, weaker than what we would have expected or stronger than what we would have hoped for, specifically the fact that um, rising unemployment rate will probably help lower interest rates. But as 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 we know that uh, we'll see how the Fed decides to play that one. Looking at oil prices, too, we actually had a little bit of a choppy day. We were up about two and a you know maybe a percent percent and a half um towards the latter half of the day. Saw a little bit of a tumble. Currently sitting at eighty ninety two. Um, you know here as we record this about five forty five here on Monday evening. So you know an interesting movement down. Really, what we're we're what we're seeing in that is is over the weekend. I think the big news Stu is that Saudi reaffirmed both on Sunday that they're going to continue the additional voluntary cuts of one million barrels per day in, in hopes of keeping their output about around nine million barrels. That really kind of buoyed prices early, late. Mm. Um, um, you know, early on is the trading session, but then we saw a big fall off again. I think a lot of this production cut news has really been baked into the market and 
I read somewhere that Saudi is, is, is considering another drop and they will continue to reevaluate as they go. Um, you know, and specifically, here's what um, this is UBS strat- strategist Giovanni Starvano. The cuts could be extended into the first quarter of 2024 because, quote, seasonal weaker oil demand at the start of every year, ongoing economic growth concerns and the aim of producers and OPEC to support the oil market stability and balance could mean that these cuts will continue and that will only help keep prices where they're at. But again, um, with the overall market really not pricing in much of what's going on um, in the Israel Hamas conflict right now. Um, it, it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see how things continue to play out. Um, gas prices um, did open up a little bit lower today. Natural gas currently trading at three dollars and twenty eight cents after opening a little um, or after closing a little under three dollars and fifty cents. Again, mainly due to a little bit of of, of warmer weather. We uh, ex, uh, warmer weather is expected to kind of come through here, and and specifically in the winter, that's going to lead to to slightly softer prices. Um, I think the only other interesting thing of note, Stu, we saw was a you know we we did see some you know. Sand Sandridge Energy went ahead and uh, announced earnings. We saw Coterra Energy announce earnings. Um, you know, yesterday we we specifically covered kind of our last peek at what Pioneer's doing. Um, but I thought there was one interesting deal north of the border, aka in Canada, which are our second favorite um, country. Um, out, you know, we love Alberta. Um, and, 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 and that, you know, not so much maybe, uh, Ontario or wherever, uh, wherever Quebec is it Quebec. Is that where their capital is? Quebec. So maybe, maybe Quebec, Quebec and California, they got a, a lot in common, but, uh, we love everybody up in Alberta. Um, I'm not as familiar with the, with, with, uh, with the Canadian M&A market, but, but a private oil and gas company, Hammerhead Inc. Um, they're actually a public company here, um, trading on the NASDAQ HHRS. They've gone ahead and announced an indefinite agreement, um, to go ahead and sell to Crescent Point, uh, a pretty large oil and gas operator with significant stake up there. Um, specifically in that Montney shale, um, you know, that's big the way it's been described to me. The Montney is the equivalent of the Permian Basin, Stu. It's thick zones couple different uh pay zones you can target you know you can kind of wine rack the the wells you get a lot per location everything will everyone loves a good little um montney shale buy so um, i also love the accent whenever you're talking to anybody up there with the ceos i visit with montney <laughs> montney montney um so hammerhead and, and crescent boy both public companies hammerhead majority actually owned by riverstone though um so they're going to go ahead and cash out um this deal is about 2.55 billion and assumes a 17 percent premium over the five um, day weighted trading volume average you know they're doing about uh, 56,000 BOE per day so if you do the math on that deal Stu it's about 45,000 for flowing wow. BOE which is you know not horrible considering the fact that they'll, they'll claim there's 800 locations available to drill so you know again All tier one I, I don't want to make a one-to-one comparison between the Permian and the Montney, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say there's probably not 800 locations that are worth drilling. We'll probably cut that number in half. Um, but this, again, is another consolidation move. You know, surprised we're not seeing more of this, to be honest, when it comes to Canadian oil and gas, considering we're seeing a lot of it, you know, in the United States where you would consider the returns are going to be a little bit better considering right. the diversification. But, you know, good for the hammerhead. You know, I'm, I'm never one to stand up for Riverstone. They're not necessarily known to uh um you know as much as i want to stand up and uh and, and cheer that a private equity company got paid i think it's uh, a good deal for the management team there um yeah. you know that 17 percent premium not horrible I mean, it's a little bit better than what i uh, a little bit better than what exxon paid for pioneer so uh you know good for good for riverstone able to negotiate but um you know we'll, we'll be following this one closely and again cool. you know what a, what a, what a, is this a good deal or not? The only time will tell, but uh, we will we'll be following this one. Um, congrats to the Crescent Point team and, and, and Hammerhead um, all in one. That's really all I've got, Stu. What else, what, what else should we be worried about this week? Oh, uh, just more coming around the corner. I get to visit with some more folks from Norway. Uh, I got a few others coming up, so it's going to be a lot of fun. We just dropped Captain uh, Kelly's. Uh, he was a hoot. I actually got a little choked up on that one as the staff got that one out there. That was uh, a little rough as he was talking about it, but it is about energy, uh, solving the energy problems. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Humanitarian. Absolutely. So, well, we appreciate everybody sticking with us here on this Tuesday. Um, you know, stay strong. Week is almost done here, but we'll let you get out of here and finish and start your day. For Stuart Turley, I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.